This clock has a very plain case, unornamented. It was not designed to go in a country house. In fact, it was specifically designed to help measure the transit of Venus going across the face of the sun. And it's made by Ellicott, London. This clock um, has an adjustable means of adjusting the temperature compensation so that it could be then more easily calibrated um, so that it kept accurate time in the tropics, in the heat, or in the polar regions when it was cold. And it certainly had to do both. Several portable regulators were purchased by the Royal Society for observations of the transit of Venus in 1761 and 1767. And this clock appears to have been specifically constructed to serve as one of these transit clocks. This pair of transits occurs only once every 113 years, and the Royal Society wanted to use these events for simultaneously observing the transit to enable the Earth's distance from the Sun to be calculated more accurately. This clock cost um, 35 pounds, eight shillings and no pence from John Ellicott for use in Sumatra by Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon who were to give their names to the Mason-Dixon line between Pennsylvania and Maryland. They sailed in HMS Seahorse on the 9th of January, 1761 for Sumatra, but were engaged by a French privateer, Aigret, before leaving the channel. Seahorse limped back into Plymouth with 11 killed and 39 wounded. And after repairs to the ship, so much time was lost that Cape Town was chosen for the new site for their observations. In June 1767, this Ellicott clock was again used for the second transit of Venus, this time in the Prince of Wales Fort in Hudson Bay in Canada, a cold place. It looks as if the clock was finally sold by the Royal Society to Lord Howe as one of their fellows, though no paperwork has been found to confirm this. Equally, no other clock has been found to match the description of the Ellicott transportable regulator purchased by the Royal Society. And no one seriously doubts the provenance from Admiral Richard Earl Howe by descent to the Countess Mountbatten of Burma. So if you look inside, You can see the big pendulum and you've got a little weight here and the driving weight. And then you've got this steel rod coming down. And the steel rod has in the back of it a brass rod and they're riveted together here with a fixed rivet. And then these are clearance rivets so that it, as the steel goes down, the brass goes up. And then there's a lever mechanism at the top to change the small motion here to the correct ratio to lift the pendulum up and down to give temperature compensation. And the whole of the top with the dust protector comes off. Then you can see the mechanism of the clock behind and the temperature compensation lever is at the back there. The temperature compensation bar, you can just see the end of it coming up um, at that point there. And the lever then uh, lifts from here the pendulum up and down. And by using this adjustment here, you can move the position across the top which will then increase or decrease the temperature compensation. And so this would be set up by Ellicott um, in London and so that the match between the pendulum rod and all the parts would give the temperature compensation necessary for the polar regions, the cold and the tropics, the heat. Then it's on a 
seat board here which is just clipped into place. You can see the two little sliding latches which I can pull down and open. And then in the field it's possible to take the pendulum off and just slide the whole of the movement out um, to do whatever it might be necessary in the field. So that it's designed uh, for the ease of use in the field and hopefully nothing goes wrong but if it does it's quite easy then to take it out and then fix whatever you wanted to and lock it back into place with the latches which simply go up like that. On the side of the case you can see various slots and they are all designed so that the pendulum can be lifted up a bit and clamped into place taking the suspension spring off from being under tension and then the whole of the clock can be transported in a ship. I've placed the back clamping position um, into place and the pendulum is now located in it. It's also been raised up very slightly um, by the felt underneath the location piece here so that the weight of the pendulum is held here and not on the suspension spring as it's banged around being carried to and from the boat um, before it gets in the observatory to do the transits of Venus. And then to clamp it into place uh, we have the two sliders. You can see the slots in the side here. The bottom one with the felt, the angle to take the pendulum, slides in and clamps and the top one which again has the shape uh, to take the pendulum and the slots to clear these two locations here and that slides in and then it's just flush with the edge of the door so that the door holds the clamps into place. Um, then it's locked and holds everything rigid for the transit 